I was just sitting there at my desk in school during class, and I think it was ninth grade, but I'm not 100% sure on that. And I noticed there on the floor next to my desk was this folded up piece of paper. And so I reached down and picked up the note. I opened it up and read it. Yeah, I wish I hadn't read it. It was a conversation between a couple middle school girls. It was girl talk. I, I was kind of embarrassed by what I read. I, I really wish I hadn't picked it up. That leads to the question, who, who would read something that wasn't written to them or, or about them? Well, uh, hopefully you will. I, I'm not talking about a note between you know, two middle school girls here. I'm, I'm talking about the book of Isaiah. Let me just jump right into it. The very first verse says, says this, The vision concerning Judah and Jerusalem that Isaiah, son of Amos, saw during the reigns of uh, Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah of Judah. You can clearly see this is a vision, but it's concerning Judah and Jerusalem. We don't live there. Uh, And it's uh, written to Old Covenant Jews. Uh, Most of you are probably not Jews. You are what the Bible would call Gentiles. And if you're a believer, you are not under the Old Covenant. You're under the New Covenant. But that's who this is written to. Old Covenant Jews about their issues with God and about future events, half of which are now in the past (laughs) at the time of this recording, for sure. So if it wasn't written to us, and it's not written about us, Why should we study it, and why should you read it? And by the way, I'm really hoping you will. We're going to take about nine weeks to get through this series, and there's 66 chapters, so if you would read a chapter each day, you'll be roughly uh, on track with me as I go through this book with you. So why, though, should you read it? Why should we study it? Well, it reminds me of what Paul wrote to his protege, Timothy, in 2 Timothy 3, 16-17. Paul said, All scripture is inspired by God and is profitable for teaching, for rebuking, for correcting, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. Paul knew that everything that God inspired for us to read has some sort of usefulness to it. And that's exactly the case here in this book of Isaiah. There is something very valuable in this book for us, even though the primary message isn't about us, or to us. So what is it that I think you'll get out of reading the book of Isaiah and studying it along with us? Well, several things, but the first thing is this. We get these snapshots of God as you read through it. This book brings us face to face with God. And at times it's comforting. At other times, to be honest, it's terrifying. As you read through this book, you notice that this is not a tame God, and this is not a bedtime story. There are lots of people who die in this book. At one point, as I was reading through the book, I just tried to make a list of not how many people, but how many nations are devastated at the hand of God. There's Israel and Judah and Assyria and Babylon and Philistia and Moab and Cush and Egypt and Keter, which is Arabia. And then, of course, there's the story of the night when 185,000 Assyrian soldiers are put to death because their leader blasphemed God. You also can't read this book without catching the justice and the holiness and the love and the goodness of God. And I think one of the things that really strikes me as I read through Isaiah is that God is these things, and therefore He acts the way He does. He God doesn't just have a bent towards kindness or justice or whatever. He is all of these things all the time. And they interplay with each other in the events that you read about in this particular book. We also get snapshots of humanity. This book brings us face to face with human character. And we see, as we read through it, that given the opportunity, we will oppress others. We will make idols out of things. We'll take the credit for the good stuff in our lives. We'll deceive ourselves. We will break our promises. We will blame others. And we won't care about the plight of future generations as long as our lives are reasonably comfortable. You see all of that in the book of Isaiah. It's like all the masks come off in this book. We see God for who he is. We see Jesus for who he is. And we see ourselves. There's another thing we get besides these incredible snapshots uh, in in this book of Isaiah. We, We get a lot of confidence in the truth of the Bible through this book. 
you'll see as you read through it that there are literally dozens and dozens and dozens of prophecies made in this book, and they're made hundreds of years in advance, many of which have already come true. And so as we read through that and we see, okay, yeah, God prophesied that very distinctly, and yeah, that happened, it just gives us a lot of confidence in the rest of the Bible. And finally, I think as you read through this book, we learn a lot about our hope in God. This is a book uh, that has a lot of devastation in it and a lot of judgment, but the book speaks often of hope. There is a strong, absolute confidence that there will be a bright future. What strikes me about that is there's that confidence, this hope, even though there's no evidence that Israel will ever get its act together. You'll remember that Israel was bound by the Old Covenant, and the Old Covenant was a conditional covenant. God said, if you'll do this, then I'll do that. And there's no evidence in the book that Israel ever did what they promised to do. And yet God still speaks words of hope in chapter after chapter in the book of Isaiah. And it just shows that our hope is based on God's character, not their reformation. Our hope is based on God's promises, not our good works or our worthiness. So, I hope you'll dive in. I hope you'll read it and study it along with me. We're going to look at chapter 1 today. And chapter 1 is kind of like an abstract of the entire book. In chapter 1, you'll find almost all the major themes. So, let's just get right into it. Chapter 1 of Isaiah, starting at verse 2. Listen, heavens, and pay attention, earth, for the Lord has spoken. I have raised children and brought them up, but they have rebelled against me. The ox knows its owner and the donkey its master's feeding trough, but Israel does not know. My people do not understand. O oh, sinful nation, people weighed down with iniquity, brood of evil doers, depraved children. They have abandoned the Lord. They have despised the Holy One of Israel. They have turned their backs on Him. Wow. These opening verses just show us in, in clear detail that God is a relationship-driven God. He says he's a father and Israel is his child. And you notice as well in these opening verses that they are in rebellion. You know, that reminds me that perfect parenting doesn't guarantee that kids will not rebel. God truly was a perfect father, a loving father. He did not spoil them and yet he prospered them and blessed them. He, he gave them the right balance of responsibilities and privileges. He communicated clearly. He was deeply interested in their lives. He was involved in their lives. He was the perfect parent, and yet they rebelled. Perfect parenting doesn't guarantee that our kids won't rebel. And in the next few, few verses, we see that they, Israel, were receiving the consequences of their rebellion. God was doing for them exactly what he promised he would do. Verse 5. Why do you want more beatings? Why, why do you keep on rebelling? The whole head is hurt. The whole heart is sick. From the sole of the foot even to the head, no spot is uninjured. Wounds, welts, and festering sores, not cleansed, bandaged, or soothed with oil. Your land is desolate. Your cities burn down. Foreigners devour your fields right in front of you. A desolation, like a place demolished by foreigners. Daughter Zion is abandoned like a shelter in a vineyard, like a shack in a cucumber field, like a besieged city. If the Lord of armies had not left us a few survivors, we'd be like Sodom. We would resemble Gomorrah. In these verses, you see the consequences on the nation. No part of life was unaffected by the consequences of their rebellion. And on top of that, there's no healing taking place. The cities are burned down. Foreigners take the majority of the crops as tribute. And only a small percentage of the population are even still around. Verse 10. Hear the word of the Lord, you rulers of Sodom. Listen to the instruction of our God, you people of Gomorrah. Now let me just pause here and say, God's not actually talking to Sodom and Gomorrah. Those cities were wiped out. He's calling Jerusalem. Sodom. He's calling them Gomorrah as a way to get their attention, to, to, to wake them up. When they heard that, they would have remembered Sodom and Gomorrah was synonymous with wickedness and depravity. And that's what God is calling them. He's calling them names, if you will, to try to shake them out of their slumber and to get their attention. Verse 11, what are all your sacrifices to me? Asked the Lord. 
I've had enough of burnt offerings and rams and the fat of well-fed cattle. I have no desire for the blood of bulls, lambs, or male goats. When you come to appear before me, who requires this of you? This trampling of my courts. Stop bringing useless offerings. Your incense is detestable to me. New moons and Sabbaths and the calling of solemn assemblies. I can't stand iniquity with a festival. I hate your new moons and prescribed festivals. They become a burden to me. I'm tired of putting up with them. When you spread out your hands in prayer, I will refuse to look at you. Even if you offer countless prayers, I will not listen. Whoa. These were church people. They were attending the, all the festivals. They were showing up on the Sabbath day. On Saturday, they were showing up there at the temple, and they were going through the motions. They were bringing their, their animals for sacrifice. They, they did the prescribed religious holidays, all those things that God commanded them to do. But in this case, God hated those activities. Why? What was going on? Well, later in Isaiah, we get a, a, a good summary of it, verse 20, uh, verse 13 of Isaiah 29 says, The Lord said, These people honor me with their speeches to honor me with lip service, yet their hearts are far from me. God said, I know what you're up to. You show up on Saturday <laughs> with your stuff, and you, but you fully intend Sunday to Friday to live exactly how you please. You're not planning to obey the covenant. You're just here hoping that if you go through the religious hoops and, and all that that's prescribed, that I will do for you what you want, but you have no intention of honoring me with obedience to the covenant. Verse 15, the second half says, Your hands are covered in blood. Wash yourselves, cleanse yourselves, remove your evil deeds from my sight. Stop doing evil. Learn to do what is good. Pursue justice. Correct the oppressor. Defend the rights of the fatherless. Plead the widow's cause. God's instruction answers the question of why he was repulsed by the religious activities. He was bothered by their injustice, their oppression, and their idolatry. You might recall that the Old Covenant had many laws, but really it came down to three basic ideas. The first was love God and serve Him only. No other gods. One God, Him alone. The second big rule was this, to be radically humanitarian in all of your dealings, and especially to care for those who couldn't care for themselves, orphans, the widows, uh, foreigners. So never oppress those people. Instead, it is your job to defend those people and make sure that they are always cared for, poor as well. And then, of course, the third part of the law was to keep the clean and unclean laws. Clearly, you can see in the instructions that God is giving to them, the problem is in the first two. They are worshiping other gods, but they have in a huge way offended God by not caring for the people that God left in their care. And so God says, your hands are covered with blood. You're, you're, not, you're, you're not stopping the oppressor. You're letting things just go on. This is the problem. Verse 18, come, let's settle this, says the Lord. Though your sins are scarlet, they will be as white as snow. Though they are crimson red, they will be like wool. If you're willing and obedient, you'll eat the good things of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, you will be devoured by the sword, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Notice, God was not passively waiting for them to repent. He wasn't up there in heaven just kind of hoping that someday they would come to their senses and they would come back. No, he, he comes to them. He sends the prophet and says, come, let's settle this. We can solve this. Come, let's get this done. Let's get this taken care of. And, and not only is he... he urging them to come. He's reminding them, hey, look, I am going to do exactly what I've said. I, I'm not ruminating about what might happen to you. I'm not just thinking about it. I have spoken. And here it is. I have spoken. And I'm saying, if you're obedient, you're going to eat of the good things of the land. Your life will be good. The stuff that you desire, I'm not blind to that. I will bring that to you. But if re you continue to rebel, you will be destroyed. God was not passive. But at the same time, the choice was theirs. And I'm thinking about that and how all of us are called by God to, to leave the insanity 
of our rebellion, to leave the insanity of our sin, and to recognize that those things that we turn to, those idols in our lives we turn to, hoping that they would make life great, are the very things that are now causing us pain and causing us heartache in life. And God says, leave the insanity of that. The only sane thing to do is to repent. God wasn't passive in their case, and I don't believe he is in ours. As we continue in this opening chapter of Isaiah, we see that God is mourning the days when Jerusalem, the city, was synonymous with freedom and justice and wholehearted devotion to God. Verse 21, the faithful town, that's what he was referring to as Jerusalem. What an adulteress she has become. The opposite of faithful, right? She was once full of justice. Righteousness once dwelt in her, but now murderers. Your silver has become dross to be discarded. Your beer is diluted with water. Your rulers are rebels, friends of thieves. They all love graft and chase after bribes. They do not defend the rights of the fatherless, and the widow's case never comes before them. You notice that in that last part, the scarcity mindset. I remember in college, my history professor talked about Europe and the wars between the European nations during the time of oh, the colonization periods, right? 15, 1600s, especially 1700s. Each nation kind of saw themselves as the possessors of a piece of the pie. And the, the amount of their pie was determined by how much wealth they had coming in from the colonies, uh, how much glory, how much power, maybe the size of their armada. And, and these nations, as they would compare themselves with each other, they always wanted to have a bigger piece of the pie, and they saw that the only way to do that was to make sure nobody else got a, a bigger piece and that maybe they could somehow expand theirs at the same time. And so anytime one nation began to grow in its uh, power or armada or, or have more colonies, the other nations would make these alliances and they'd gang up on that nation and, and they would have a war um, because they're always trying to keep their piece of the pie the same and nobody else's piece getting bigger. They never seemed to be able to realize that they could all have a bigger piece of the pie. My professor pointed out that with the discovery of the new world, we could just plain have a bigger pie. And if, every, if we were just working from a bigger pie, everybody's piece would be bigger. That was good insight, I think, on European history. But it's also good insight on what was going on in uh, Judah's history. The, Jerusalem's leadership believed that they could only prosper at the expense of others. They could only prosper, they could only have a bigger piece of the pie by slicing off a bit off of somebody else's piece and adding that over to theirs. And so that's what they were doing. They were trading justice for bribery so that they could enlarge their piece of the pie. They ignored the cause of the widow and the orphan because that didn't help them. It, it didn't give them a bigger piece of the pie. I like how one author said, the drive for more power and more security and more wealth than the present limited the leader's ability to envision a future in which all the people would experience God's blessing. Uh, just plain bigger pie. They never caught that. They had a scarcity mindset instead of an abundance mindset. In the final few verses of Isaiah 1, we see several things woven through revenge because these God worshipers were actually God's foes. But we see God also prophesying that there'll be a time of purification and eventual restoration and Israel will be a blessing to the whole world. Let's jump back in at verse 24. Therefore, the Lord God of armies, the mighty one of Israel, declares, Ah, I will get even with my foes. I will take revenge against my enemies. But notice the shift in verse 25. I will turn my hand against you and will burn away your dross completely. I will remove all your impurities. I will restore your judges to what they were at first and your advisors to what they were at the start. Afterward, you'll be called the righteous city, a faithful town. Zion will be redeemed by justice, those who repent by righteousness. At the same time, both rebels and sinners will be broken, and those who abandon the Lord will perish. And so we see in these closing verses, judgment and yet restoration, revenge and purification. Okay, we went through that first chapter quickly, in this, but in this first snapshot, what do we see about the nature of God and humanity? 
If you downloaded a, a handout to go with today's uh, message, you'll notice I put more than a dozen possibilities, little boxes you could check of things you might see in this first snapshot about God and about humanity. Perhaps you'll go down through them and check off the ones that you think were in chapter one. It, it's kind of a trick thing because in reality, I think all of them are in this first chapter. We, in, in this chapter, we see that God is relationship oriented. He wants to have a relationship with these people. He wants them back. You see these, God is committed to the covenant. Even though they are breaking the covenant, God is still committed to the promises. He's committed to the covenant. You see that God is patient. They have been rebelling now for several hundred years, and he has sent them prophet after prophet after prophet. And you notice that Isaiah is now the prophet on the scene, and Isaiah is going to continue his prophetic work for at least three kings' reigns. God is patient, but God is uncompromising. God never came to the point and never will come to the point where he says, okay, I get it. Yeah, I'm just expecting too much. We'll do it your way. You see that God is encouraging repentance. He says, come, let's settle this. Why would you continue to suffer? You don't need to do that. Come back. At the same time, he is the just judge. And he is ultimately victorious. No matter what they do, his plans are the ones that will succeed. Humanity, well, we see a lot about humanity in this first snapshot, don't we? You see that we're rebellious. Like Israel, we're often duplicitous. We, we claim that we worship God, and we do worship God, but not always with our whole heart and not always all week long. Oppressive of others. We have a scarcity mindset. We're often foolish. But at the same time, we are free to choose. God gave us that ability. That's so amazing. And we are loved. You can't miss that in this opening chapter. God loves them and he cares for them and he wants them back. They've been a thorn in his side, but he wants them back. They are precious. And did you catch that they are avenged? You'll see that throughout the book. The nation as a whole is avenged, but these widows, the, the poor, these fatherless uh, orphans who have been mistreated, they are avenged. God cares, and he comes to their eventual rescue and avenges them. So, as we bring this to a close, I want you to try to imagine something with me. Uh, imagine that, you know, you, you're going to be in a relationship with somebody. It could, it could be, a, you know, a, a romantic relationship with somebody, or it could be, you know, just a really close friend. It could be an Anne of Green Gables, booze and buddy kind of a relationship. But you're going to be in a relationship with somebody. But before it starts, you, you write down a list of key characteristics that you're kind of hoping this person will have. And, and maybe you add to a, a list of several promises you, you think that that they might make to you. And so you've got this and you write it out ahead of time. Then you imagine that you actually meet the person and you start getting to know them. You start a relationship with them. But as you get to know them, instead of adjusting what's on your sheet for what they're really like and adjusting on your sheet for, for what it is they actually promise you, 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 you're constantly trying to hold them accountable for meeting the expectations that you had ahead of time. So, so, for example, you know, maybe um, th this person, they, they love to do things that are fun, but they're a planner. They're just not a spontaneous person. And so, you know, it's Thursday, and, and they're talking with you about, hey, what, what they, we could do together this weekend. And, and you're listening to what they're saying, and you're like, well, yeah, that sounds fun and all. But you say, but, but I thought you were more spontaneous than this. Why are we planning it out? It'll be more fun if we, just, if we just do it spontaneously, you know, on Saturday or something. You just call me, and we'll go do something. And, and, and so you hold that uh, kind of against them. You hold them to that expectation of being spontaneous because you put that on, their, on your list at the beginning, but not because they're actually spontaneous, but because they're, they're actually a planner. That would make for a pretty messed up relationship, wouldn't it? I mean, it'd be hard to be really close because you you have all these warped expectations and and it's almost like you're ignoring them for who they really are. Yeah, that that's probably not going to work. But I point that out because you know that's very common practice for people to do when it comes to God. 
I think uh, it's very common for us to, to have these ideas of what we think God will be like. And, and we, you know, maybe we don't write it down, but in our head we have these ideas of what we would want our God to be and what he would be like and what promises would we want him to make to us, what commitments would we want to expect out of him. And, and, and we kind of have this all in our head, like if I'm going to believe in God and if I'm going to trust him or if I'm going to do it his way, then this is what I want my God to be like and what I want him to do what I wanted him to uh, do on my behalf. And, and if he doesn't, well, then I'm not going I'm, I'm to follow him wholeheartedly or I'm, I'm not going to give him my whole life or I may not even believe in him. Relationships are built on trust, but trust starts with truth. And here's why I want to point this out. If you want a better and a more meaningful relationship with God, read this book. Because perhaps more than any other book, in this book, God reveals himself. In the book of Isaiah, God reveals his names. And when he does that, he, his names indicate who he is from his perspective. He reveals his character. He reveals his motives. He reveals what he likes and what he hates, what he expects from those who are in a relationship with him, and things that he promises to do. God reveals himself so clearly in this book. But there's more. This book also gives us a very realistic understanding of what humanity is like apart from the new nature. A couple minutes ago, I asked you to imagine how dysfunctional of a relationship you would get if you tried to have a relationship that was bound by these other expectations instead of what the person actually said and what they're actually like. That would be pretty messed up. But imagine if we added to that that you had an incredibly warped view of yourself as well. That would be a truly dysfunctional relationship. And guys, that is so easy for us to have. It's easy for us to have a messed up view of God because instead of looking at how he reveal, reveals himself to be, we're looking at what I would want my God to be. And then we have a messed up view of ourselves, sometimes way too high, sometimes way too low. And so here's what I want to challenge you with. It's the challenge I'm giving to myself as I read through this book week after week and preparing to study it with you. Let's really try to see God as he reveals himself to be. Let's really, let's try to see God as he reveals himself to be and to see Israel and ourselves and the events of the past and the future from God's perspective. If we'll do that, if we will dig in and really try to see things from his perspective, I guarantee you it will make a difference in your ability to connect on a deep and meaningful level with God. And that will be incredibly worth it because a relationship with God that is deep and true and pure and built on trust and truth, it makes all the difference in the world.